welcome you all again. My name, for those of you who may not know me, is Angelina Godoy, and I am the director of the University of Washington Center for Human Rights. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to open this space. Uh, this is uh, a, a tradition we've established here at the Center for Human Rights. We had all, held our first spring symposium celebrating human rights in our community in 2010. So this is our 12th time doing it. And while it feels a lot different to be doing it in Zoom space than it did that first year uh, in the Walker Ames room on campus, uh, I, I am confident that I'm among friends now as I was then um, and looking forward to our discussion today. The idea behind having this annual event every year is that in all of our work for human rights, a lot of times we're exposed to some pretty bad news. Um, we don't always win. In fact, we sometimes it seems rare when we win. Um, and we wanted to have an event every year that held up important moments of uh, making uh, collaboration, uh, the beauty of resistance, uh, the beauty of the dreams that we forge together as a community or a network of many communities dreaming of a better world. So this event today um, is, is designed to hold up a particular collaboration uh, that's known as the Human Rights Observatory or the Immigrant Rights Observatory here at the Center for Human Rights, um, which we have created with a number of partner organizations, some of whom are represented here on the panel. Before we turn to that, however, I want to say just a few words for those who may be new to our work at the center about what we do. So we're, uh, we are academics, we're based at the University of Washington, of course, um, but we occupy kind of a, a, an unusual uh, juncture between higher education and community-based human rights advocacy. And that is exactly what I believe makes our work both innovative and exciting and also a lot of fun. So myself and other faculty members like myself um, teach and conduct research on all areas of human rights, you know, the full spectrum of rights in all areas of the world and even all of UW's three campuses and across many professional schools and uh, departments and colleges on those campuses. We have the great privilege of working with an extraordinary staff team, and I want to just mention them and thank them for all the hard work they have uh, put into this event, as they do it to all of our work. Um, they are Y. Wynn, who's our associate director, Phil Neff, who is our research coordinator, and this year, this spring, we've hired a new staff member, Andrea Marcos, who is our communications manager. So we're very excited uh, to welcome them onto this team and uh, to continue our work together uh, for the remainder of this year and into the future. We also work with the best possible students, um, and this is uh, one of the terrific privileges of our work. Um, you will tonight hear for some, from some of our student researchers who are the motor to all of our work. They're the, the ideas that uh, give us energy and inspiration, and they're the engine that keep us going. Um, and I also want to highlight some of our students um, who are receiving special honors today. We every year um, issue a series of awards made possible by the generosity of our community to students from across our campuses and uh, professional schools and departments in recognition of their outstanding work in human rights. So I wanna to turn to that task now, if you will, and introduce to you um, some of our awardees this year. First, you see here on the screen, Niura Yasmin Krasor Romo, uh, who is the recipient of this year's Abe Osheroff and Gunnell Clark Endowed Fund for Human Rights. This fund was established to promote human rights projects, forging social change through direct action. And Niyuda, who uh, is a student at the UW School of Law, will be expecting her graduation in June of this year um, in sustainable development program. She also holds a law degree from the Universidad Autónoma de Aguas Calientes in Mexico. She will be working with global rights advocacy and La Resistencia on a project to hold the US government and the GEO Group, the private company that runs the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma, accountable for ongoing abuses in that facility. Next, I would like to congratulate Katie Sophie Gonser, who is the recipient of the Dr. Lisa Sable Brown Endowed Fund for Human Rights, which provides funds to support graduate study or research in human rights. Katie is a PhD candidate in international studies at the Jackson School of International Studies. 
and she is working on a dissertation project which examines the ability of humanitarian organizations to impact the human rights situation in North Korea. Congratulations, Katie. Next, we have Hannah Garland, who is the recipient of the Peter Mack and Jamie Mayerfeld Fund, which was established to support graduate research in human rights at the University of Washington. Hannah is pursuing a degree at the UW Law School, and she will be working this summer as a legal fellow on the death penalty abolition team of an organization called Reprieve USA, which seeks abolition of capital punishment in the United States. Next, we have the Benjamin Linder Fund. Our recipient is Nancy Rose Houston. Nancy Rose is a joint MA student in the Jackson School of International Studies and the Evans School of Public Policy here at UW Seattle. She has actually joined the Human Rights Observatory Project about which you will be hearing more tonight. And lastly, we have Trung An Nguyen, the recipient of this year's Jennifer Caldwell Fund, established to honor a beloved alumnus of the University of Washington. Trung An is a student in the Jackson School of International Studies. And while working on her dissertation, she has been working for several years as part of a research team here at the Center for Human Rights, conducting quantitative research on immigration detention in the United States. So we congratulate these students and all of our other students who are using their education in action to promote human rights. Now, I'd like to present uh, the panel discussion and the Human Rights Observatory that it seeks to spotlight. As I mentioned before, the Center for Human Rights occupies a, a unique position at the juncture of community-based work to make our world better for human rights and academic work uh, at the University of Washington. This partnership between academics and community-based leaders is what distinguishes this particular effort, the Human Rights Observatory. Today, we seek to spotlight it as an example of this kind of innovative collaboration. The observatory came into being in 2020 at the initiative of many of the organizations who are represented on this panel, who are some of the, the leaders who worked hard to pass both Keep Washington Working in 2019 and the Courts Open to All Act in 2020, two pieces of innovative legislation here in the state of Washington that put Washington at the forefront of national efforts to promote the rights of immigrants in our communities, also known as sanctuary efforts. These laws arguably gave Washington some of the strongest tools to disentangle local government and law enforcement officials from the enforcement of civil immigration infractions in our state. So we owe it to many of the folks on the panel tonight, this important victory and distinction for the state of Washington. At the same time, these leaders asked us if we could help them come up with an idea and a form of monitoring the implementation of these two important laws. Because as we all know, laws on paper can too often be dead letter laws. And in order to ensure that these laws were actually being uh, upheld, particularly in districts where there had been some vocal opposition from leadership in the state of Washington to their very implementation, we designed a research project to monitor implementation and enforcement of these laws. And we took the name Observatory from many similar efforts that inspired us across Latin America, where the term uh, un observatorio de derechos humanos or a human rights observatory is a common way of understanding this task. And indeed, understand the collaboration between university researchers and community-based leaders as well. So we've been working together on this initiative ever since. And today we are going to hear on this panel from folks who play different roles and continue to, to nourish the work of the observatory. I'll introduce them each before they speak, uh, but we are going to begin first uh, with Annie Benson. So Annie's a person uh, in the field of immigrant rights uh, or movement lawyering in Washington state 
who almost needs no introduction. Um, she has worked throughout Washington State. First, she served as legal director of the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, and then she was the founding director of the Washington Defender Association's Immigration Project. She's currently a senior directing attorney at the Washington Defender Association, also known as the WDA, um, and she has been a board member of the National Immigration Project, the Network to End Violence Against Women, and One America. She's also taught here at the University of Washington as an adjunct professor of law and served as a longstanding member of Washington State's Minority and Justice Commission. So welcome, Annie. Annie, you're on mute. Can you unmute? Thank you, Angelina, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, I always wish that my mom were on these events so that my mom could hear all these things. <laughs> um, and thank you to everyone out there who's taken the time to join tonight. It's so wonderful to be uh, to be asked to help lift up the work of the UW Center for Human Rights, uh, which has been one of the uh, bright spots uh, in my professional work here. As Angelina said, I am the directing attorney at the Washington Defender Association. Uh, WDA is the resource center for public defenders <clears throat> uh, here throughout the state of Washington. And the public defenders uh, in 2000 recognized that they were doing all this great public defense for their clients, but their clients who were not US citizens were still getting deported. So they became, <clears throat> we became the second state where the public defenders went and they stole me away from the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project and said, figure out how to put a project together so that we can defend non-citizens who are accused of crimes and resolve their cases to keep, to do everything we can to keep them from being deported. Um, so that was 22 years ago. And uh, I'm happy to report that the project is thriving and that we, one of the greatest things that we get to do here is work with our community partners, not just to actually work on individual cases, but to make the kind of systemic change that we need. Um, so Phil, if you could pop up the next slide. Oh, I think that's not the next slide. I'm, uh, oh yeah, sorry, I was looking for the images. Okay, so tonight I'm gonna just take a few moments to speak to the substance of the laws that Angelina spoke about um, and a little bit about the community, um, the incredible community collaboration. Um, it was what we call uh, a such a grassroots, grass tops uh, effort and it was successful in passing what became two landmark uh, laws. Before I jump into doing that, um, I want to just remind folks uh, of the context in which this all happened. Um, because, you know, the immigration, the ICE enforcement dragnet had been unleashed for some time, as we all know, and was gaining a lot of steam. And then uh, the 27, excuse me, the 2016 election happened. And um, the Trump administration then uh, supercharged the, uh, and expanded exponentially the ICE enforcement dragnet. So a couple of ways that they did this was that they, um, they significantly increased the number of ICE and Border Patrol agents who were set to roam <laughs> the countryside terrorizing communities. Um, and for the first time ever, they invoked this unusual provision in the immigration law that had never been invoked was they gave ICE agents the power to directly deport people. So people were being deported just based upon an ICE officer's determination uh, and they had no access to the courts. Um, and they weren't just prioritizing people who had actually been convicted of crimes that triggered deportation, but they were prioritizing apprehending and arresting anyone who was merely suspected of committing a crime. In addition to that, as folks may know, they dramatically increased uh, ICE detention center contracts. The Obama administration had been pulling back on that and they, um, they began a process of increasing them full stop. Um, 
And so within a short period of time, arrests and deportations had increased by 40%. Uh, and the communities were being just utterly terrorized uh, by these actions. And so we here in Washington pulled together this amazing coalition of organizations and Elise from Win America is going to be talking to you a little bit more about these pieces and parts of the work. But it was truly remarkable. I've been an immigrant, oh, excuse me, I've been a movement lawyer in immigrant rights work for 30 years. And this was truly one of the most stunning and inspiring um, things that I have been uh, honored to participate in. So the Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network did not exist prior to 2016. And within a matter of months, this incredible group of community organizers had come together and began constructing this incredible grassroots uh, network and organization to begin uh, organizing for how the pushback was gonna happen against what was happening. Wyson, as we call them, uh, quickly became the national lodestar, the national, uh, the benchmark for where all other states were trying to get to. And so um, <clears throat> we began working on this around this time, and it took us a number of years, but it was the folks, the organizations that you see here who came to the table and really began pulling together, doing not only the wonky legal stuff like I and some of the other lawyers do, which is like writing the draft laws and figuring out who we need to um, engage with in the institutional players, but began doing this incredible community organizing <clears throat> um, effort um, to really be the push because that's what gets these things across the line. And in that process, then we got to work with this array of state actors, many of whom you may recognize. Um, and it was also an incredible partnership between the institutional players, as we call them, the state actors. You'll see Justice Mary, you here, um, obviously the governor, Bob Ferguson. And then a key player in this was a man named Steve Strachan, who was the head of the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs. A couple of other states, California, New York, Illinois, tried to do what we did, and they did pass some laws, but their laws were much narrower in terms of what they did because they couldn't get the law enforcement to come to the table and agree to, if not support, at least not oppose the laws. And Steve Strachan and the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs came to the table and we did hardcore negotiations to actually uh, get to the place where they agreed because they really understood that effective law enforcement requires community trust. And they didn't want to be pulled into doing all of this ICE enforcement collaboration because that was a key piece of how they were implementing these policies. ICE was fusing themselves into local jails and with local uh, sheriffs and police chiefs um, in order to well, in order to open even further what we call the jail to deportation pipeline. Um, prior to the work that we've done here, the vast majority of people, or the majority of people in any way, who ended up in the ICE detention center got there because ICE would get them right from jail. The local jails would call and say, hey, we're releasing Bob on Tuesday at five o'clock and ICE would be right there to pick up Bob. Um, and so that's what we went after. And this array of state actors, I'm gonna call a big shout out to Lisa Wellman, uh, Senator Wellman, who really led this effort. Uh, she's the woman in blue there, second from the top. And so what we did was we passed the Keep Washington Working Act. And as Angela referenced, and I'm gonna say again, this was a landmark piece of legislation. Um, to this day, the only other state, and I think it just happened last year, that has passed a law that goes this far to cut off ICE collaboration with local law enforcement is Illinois. And we were the first in the country uh, to do this. And it was pretty, um, 
it's pretty radical what we did um, in this context. So in Washington, no law enforcement, no jail is allowed to collect people's place of birth, immigration or citizenship status information. That was the key way that ICE would target people who were in jail. Um, our jails and our law enforcement are not permitted to notify ICE when they are releasing someone from custody. So they can't get information on who's in custody in terms of their immigration status information, and they can't be notified when that person is getting released from custody. They also oh no, are no longer, the jails cannot allow ICE to interview anyone in the jail unless that person is given written notification that they must first consent to the interview. So in order for ICE to talk to anybody in jail, that person has to give written consent and the form has to be in a language that they understand. Um, <clears throat> um, they also, local jails and local law enforcement are not permitted to enforce immigration laws. They cannot take people into custody uh, based upon immigration documentation, a civil warrant or something like that. Um, they're not permitted to do that. And they also, our local law enforcement officers cannot be deputized to act as ICE agents, which is permitted under federal law and many other states actually have their local law enforcement deputized to act as ICE agents. So it's really a groundbreaking landmark piece of legislation. And now I'm quickly gonna talk about what happened next because that happened in 2019. And in 2019, I'm imagining many of you who are participating today became aware of the fact that ICE was going to local courts and rounding up people who were being, um, <clears throat> who were showing up, not only showing up for court, but showing up to access court services. And this completely outraged our Supreme Court. Justice Fairhurst, um, <clears throat> uh, who was the head of the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Yu, a number of other, I mean, the judicial community in many excuse me, many facets of the judicial community was up in arms about people getting arrested. And in a short period of time, once they started doing this here, over 200 people were arrested, uh, sometimes brutally, um, when they came to court to show up for a hearing, to answer a criminal charge, to get a protection order, uh, to file a marriage license. Um, so this quickly became a crisis, not just in Washington, but across the country. And that same group of people that you saw, both the state actors and the organizations came together. And we worked with a law professor in Colorado who had come up with this he'd found this 16th century common law writ that was still good law, that was known as a writ of prohibition. So we reinvigorated a 500 year old law that says that you cannot arrest people coming to court. So the Keep Washington Working, excuse me, the Courts Open to All Act passed in 2020, uh, was signed by Governor Inslee, and it now prohibits ICE or Border Patrol arresting anyone on court property unless they have an actual criminal warrant issued by a criminal judge. And even then, they can't make that arrest until they come to the head judge, the presiding judge at that court and show the judge that they have a criminal warrant. <clears throat> and all federal and state law enforcement. So all ICE agents, if they're even going to go on court property, they have to go check in uh, with the court and explain that they are an ICE agent and tell them in writing while the, why they are there. So this was the first law of its kind, and it still is the most expansive law of its kind. And so we made some pretty good lemonade, excuse me, we made some pretty good lemonade out of those toxic lemons that we got thrown um, by the previous administration. Um, and it was, it's was it been a very exciting thing. Elise is gonna talk about the community engagement effort that went into that. But I'm gonna end my comments by saying, it's really awesome to pass good laws. But if you can't implement and enforce them, then they don't really mean much. And that is where 
the UW Center for Human Rights really sat down to the table with all of those groups that you saw to figure out how they could use their incredible resources to actually get the data, synthesize the data, work with us to figure out where the law was being implemented, where it wasn't, and how it was actually having an impact. I can't overstate the value of this because none of those organizations that you saw there have the capacity to do what the Center for Human Rights did. And the work that they have done has allowed us and continues to allow us to actually be able to go into these communities and say to the sheriffs and say to the courts, hey, you're not following the law. And here's the data that proves you're not following the law. And we can go to the attorney general and say, hey, the sheriff in X county is violating Keep Washington Working. And so it queues up being able to think about doing even more significant efforts like lawsuits that they really don't want. Um, and But without the information and the partnership with the UW Center for Human Rights, we would not, this kind of implementation and making these things real for people on the ground uh, to actually infuse these rights with meaning and purpose and to make them real wouldn't be happening. So it's been an honor and a privilege and I will now pass it to, I believe Tara, I think is next. Uh, thank you, Annie, so much. I just want to say, uh, first of all, to remind everyone that if you have questions, so please enter them in the Q&A box down at the foot of your screen. Um, and uh, I'll just say a few words about Tara and uh, Thomas. So as I mentioned before, the, one of the great privileges of my work is that I get to work with wonderful students and uh, Tara and Thomas are, are perhaps among the best shining examples of that. Uh, when Annie refers to the the, what did you say, the incredible resources of the Center for Human Rights, those resources, what makes our resources incredible is the human resources. And uh, uh, Tara and Thomas are great examples of that. So I'll just say a little bit about each of them um, and then turn it over to them. So Tara is a senior and she's majoring in international studies. Uh, she joined the Center for Human Rights in the summer of 2019, and she has been working on this particular project, the Immigrant Rights Observatory, uh, monitoring immigrant rights and compliance with these two uh, pieces of legislation about which Annie just spoke. And she will be joined by Thomas, who is a third year law student. He's been at uh, the center since spring 2020. In fact, he and I didn't even see one another in, in the flesh um, until very recently because he's been with us throughout the pandemic time. Um, he conducts research and writing in, in this work for us. He's also interviewed local law enforcement officials about their relationships, both with ICE and the Border Patrol. Um, and we are very uh, both excited and pleased that Tara and Thomas are both graduating, but we're also secretly very sad because they've been such wonderful uh, team members. So I'll turn it over to them. Thank you, Angelina. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Tara. Um, so I just want to start out by really underscoring um, what Angelina has said about how unique the center is um, in the work that we do. The reason that it's so important and unique is the way we go about finding records um, and finding evidence for all these ways that we can document harm and give a voice um, to these people that are seeing these things take place in their communities. They're seeing their family members disappear. Um, and it's a great privilege to be able to use um, legislation to actually give a voice to them. Um, so the biggest tool that we use, as Angelina had mentioned briefly, is the Public Records Act. Um, it was passed in Washington in 1973, and anyone can use it. Um, we use it all the time to get access to all sorts of records. Um, and it's, I think, one of the best ways to keep um, our law enforcement agencies accountable as well as um, understanding ways that we can kind of take power um, that we have um, in order to, to keep our, our law enforcement agencies accountable. So I just wanted to first start out um, by talking about the different ways that we went about starting this project. Um, as Annie mentioned, there's kind of a few different categories of Keep Washington Working. Um, and we decided that the best way to go about this project um, in monitoring exactly how counties were implementing this legislation was to divide it into categories um, and then be able to analyze the documents based on a few different perspectives. So the first one we were looking at um, were just policies and we were interested in whether counties were actually using any loopholes to get around the legislation that was passed 
um, whether they were using the model policies that the Attorney General's Office published in May of 2020, um, and how they were um, appointing people to keep their employees accountable and trained on Keep Washington Working. The second thing we were looking at was interview consent forms. As Annie mentioned, um, it's incredibly important to understand how um, ICE and CBP agents are able to gain access to individuals um, and to understand exactly how the jail to deportation pipeline is happening. Um, and this was one of the first ways that we were able to characterize which counties were keeping track um, of who was signing forms and which counties were just giving access, um, free range access to ICE agents. And the last um, and the largest way that we really use the public records law is to request email documentation. Um, and we've requested uh, thousands upon thousands of pages of records um, spanning all the way from 2019 um, until just most recently we requested uh, February 2022. Um, and sometimes counties take a long time to get us records back um, and that can place a little bit of a lag on our work. Um, but it's the public records is something really special um, and we're going to go into a few cases of exactly how we can document harm um, and use it to keep to keep these entities accountable. Um, but first, I want to pass it to Thomas, who's going to talk a little bit about what we do with the records um, and how we work together um, to analyze them. Thank you, Tara. My name is Thomas. I use he, him pronouns. And like Angelina said, I've been with the center since spring of 2020. I think one great example of how our, our way of conducting this research and these investigations really work um, in a special way is our investigation into Okanagan County Jail's collaboration with ICE, which it, uh, it was an investigation that took place over several years, and it involved many members of the, of the Center for Human Rights team, including some who have graduated and moved on by now, but um, a very interdisciplinary group of us. So that investigation, while it had been ongoing, um, particularly as we went through troves of records of deportability that had been generated by CBP and obtained by the organization, while, while we were going through those documents, narrowing down with help from our coalition partners, which counties we'd wanna look into further, we decided to conduct interviews of a few key county jail administrators to see their perspective on the Keep Washington working act, how they believe it affected their work and whether they thought they had to change any of the problematic practices that we saw reflected in CBP records uh, regarding those counties. When we interviewed the undersheriff that ran the Okanagan County Jail, it became quickly clear to us that they understood the Keep Washington Working Act as affecting very little of their policies with regard to how they treated um, persons suspected of being born outside of the United States or having um, not having documentation. So we interviewed them and as a part of that learned that under certain circumstances, they plan to continue accepting detainer requests from ICE, requests to hold on to individuals who had been released by the jail until ICE could come and pick them up and determine whether or not to deport those individuals. And so we submitted several public records requests to that county and were able to find, in fact, that they had been exchanging detainer requests with ICE and CBP and honoring those requests, holding individuals for up to 42 hours after they had been deemed eligible for release by a local judge, just so that CBP or ICE could, could come and pick them up and decide then what to do with, with those individuals. Having access to records from CBP and ICE on the one hand, from local jails on the other, and being able to have people with quantitative and qualitative research experience, law students and students at the information school, being able to work with coalition partners from a variety of different organizations means that we have a whole different set of eyes and, and perspectives on these, on these records. Ultimately, in the case of Okanagan County, we were able to use this interdisciplinary approach to paint a very complete picture from the policy level down to how it affects individuals of how Keep Washington Working was impacting or not impacting that jail. 
in one case, we were able to trace an individual from the moment of their arrest by obtaining records from local police to their incarceration at the Okanagan County Jail to their eventual handover to CDP and all of the communications between each of those agencies that allowed for that to happen. Tracing this narrative of one individual throughout the process and doing, doing this kind of research more generally allows us to really understand the full context of Keep Washington Working implementation, to isolate patterns of Keep Washington work, Working violations, and to think creatively about areas where the law could be strengthened or where we believe local law enforcement agencies might need more clarity on how they're supposed to be implementing the law. Ultimately, I think the center is uniquely situated to carry out this kind of interdisciplinary coalition work. And as a result of this kind of work, as is the case in Okanagan County, we're able to have real results in Okanagan County shortly after we published our, our 2020 report, excuse me, our 2021 report that talked about some of the violations we found there. They decided not to renew a housing agreement they had with the Department of Homeland Security an agreement which in their interviews with us, they insisted was consistent with Keep Washington working, but apparently at some point later on that year, after our research had been released, they had a change of heart. Besides Okanagan County, our research has found many examples of Keep Washington working violations. And our research is uniquely able to, to unearth these kinds of violations. And Clark County is another excellent example of that. And I think Tara would like to share a bit about Clark County. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so here we can see on the screen, um, this is an example of an email document that we got. Um, we requested from Clark County um, any emails that were exchanged between ICE or CBP agents and um, any employees of Clark County um, at the law enforcement agency and also at the correctional facility. And so this is um, a very particular example that shows really persistent and proactive information sharing on behalf of the law enforcement agencies. Here we can see um, that there's conversations having being had between Clark County and immigration enforcement officers. Um, here we can see in the second part of the email, Paul Bond, who is um, one of the correctional facility managers, actually monitors exactly who is in um, the correctional facility at any given day. And we've been seeing this um, since we've been requesting records since 2019 um, to this day in 2022. He will tip off the Portland ICE officers um, with the subject always one to check. Um, and this is extremely concerning um, because it's literally, it's handing over an individual to ICE agents. It's saying, hey, look over here, um, there's someone that we can deport. And so um, brings me to something that I would wanna talk about, um, which I think is really important. I think in human rights work, um, I think sometimes there's a problem with the spectacle of it. I think sometimes the smaller issues and the smaller instances of harm get kind of swept under the rug um, if they're not, flashy enough to catch the attention of media um, or for whatever reason, um, but this is a great example and, and I just want to explain a little bit more how exactly such a small interaction can impact someone's entire life. Um, so these interactions have been happening for years now and um, since 2019 and this type of characterization of the relationship between employees at the county level and with immigration enforcement officers is important to document because it characterizes the relationship and the ease and informality with which they converse and they actually help one another. Um, in some emails, we see them regarding each other as friends, as pals, um, using very informal language. And um, there's a lot of conversation that indicates that they actually see each other as teammates. Um, and this is really concerning. Um, it's both illegal and infuriating um, in terms of Keep Washington working. And so this has been one of our biggest focuses um, as the observatory for being able to capture the ways that law enforcement agencies have been in contact with immigration enforcement officers. Um, so I'm seeing we're getting close to time. So I think 
we will move over um, back to Thomas to talk a little bit about some code of violations that we've seen in our documents. Thank you, Thomas, again here. With regard to prosecutors, we zeroed in on four problematic offices where we had reason to believe there were potential courts open to all act violations taking place. Some of what we found was that certain prosecutors offices were coordinating with CBP and ICE when to bring charges, what charges to bring, and when to drop charges regarding individuals suspected of being non-citizens. Uh, that's important because when they dropped charges, according to the records we found, was the, the decision of when to drop charges was being used to facilitate the capture of individuals who at the time that their charges were dropped were being released from the local jail and into the hands of ICE or CBP. The fact that prosecutors were playing a role in that was um, deeply troubling and an interesting finding of our, our research. The administrative office of the courts, which oversees courts across Washington, also has specific mandates in the Courts Open to All Act, including documenting attempted entries to their facilities, to court facilities across the state by ICE or CBP personnel. While we've been reviewing these documents, all of them as they're reported on a quarterly basis, their apparent incompleteness has made it impossible for us to fully determine whether or not these incursions are still happening although we have not heard recent reports from our partners of courthouse arrest. However, in our research, we were able to find that several court clerks across the state prior to CODA had given ICE and CBP direct access to their courthouse databases, allowing court records to be transferred immediately upon request to CBP and ICE for use in their immigration enforcement work. Tara and the rest of the team have continued to dig into these kinds of connections between local, federal, and private databases like the courthouse databases, which could contain sensitive information about immigrants in Washington. As Thomas mentioned, um, the biggest issue that we're working on now at the center is the digitalization of immigration enforcement. Um, we've seen issues of surveillance creeping into lots of different parts of our work at the center um, and also in conversations with the coalition um, and with other community partners as well. We know that there exists a huge maze of intersecting databases at both the federal and local law enforcement level that ICE has unprecedented access to, we've found. Um, one particular case that we're looking into right now is for automatic license plate readers. Um, these will scan your car and then it'll take any personal identifying information that matches your car um, and it'll automatically put it into a system. Um, the problem we're finding is that these databases, they lack oversight, they lack any accountability, um, and they allow for both information sharing actively and passively. Um, we've actually found places like Okanagan County where ICE agents have direct access into the database um, and other places where automatic license plate readers are being used in the county despite having a very, very low success rate at actually preventing auto theft. Um, but instead they're being used under the guise of auto theft um, instead to carry out over surveillance of certain areas um, and it's it's leading to immigration issues um, and it's a continuing danger to our, our immigrant community. Um, like I mentioned, this is a big project that we'll be working on in the summer. Um, so hopefully you'll be hearing from the center about that soon. And I'll pass it back to Angelina. Thank you, Tara. And yes, I can assure everyone that you will be hearing from us soon <laughs> about these next uh, next upcoming research that we are engaged in on these issues. I'm very proud of the work that we are doing, the work that we've done and that's been spotlighted here so far, but I also want to emphasize that it's really truly a partnership and none of it would achieve anything in the real world if it weren't for folks uh, like Annie or like Juan Monke, to whom I'm about to turn the uh, the mic over um, because you know we are the researchers behind the scenes who dig through the technical data and we love doing that. And I'm glad we're able to 
produce something useful to you all, but uh, others are on the front lines of making this research useful to people in, uh, in their real lives and above all, making it translate hopefully into gains uh, in terms of people's access to human rights to which they are entitled. So I want to turn the uh, floor over now uh, to Juan Monge. Uh, Juan is the community organizer for an organization called Comunidades, which focuses on outreach and community engagement within Latina communities in the Columbia River Gorge area. He has been instrumental in building the change for communities of color in Southwest Washington, including advocating for laws favoring immigrant communities and fair representation. Juan? Muchas gracias. Voy a hablar en español. Voy a intentar hablar despacio. Um, soy un organizador comunitario eh, de comunidades, una organización que es, uh, amplifica las voces por la justicia social y media, medioambiental uh, y mientras aumenta el compromiso y liderazgo de la comunidad latina del Gorge. Esta Key Washington Working Act esta ley fue muy importante para mí porque fue mi primera campaña como voluntario y líder que empujé desde aquí del suroeste de, de Washington. Uh, me alegré cuando el gobernador Isley la, la firmó y, y me motivó a seguir trabajando y voluntariando en aquel tiempo con, con One America. Eh, una, y una de las cosas que siempre me, me gusta informar a la gente sobre esta, esta ley, una de las cosas que nosotros realizamos como comunidades es foros comunitarios, tanto en Escamenia como Clickitat County, del lado de Washington, y en Hood River, en Wasco County, en Oregon. Así también damos entrenamientos de liderazgo que sirven para empoderar a nuestra comunidad. También tenemos proyectos de... Eh, Uh, de periodismo eh, comunitario con líderes de diferentes partes de Washington voluntarios este, que lo transmitimos en Facebook y en YouTube. Una de las cosas, este, dando cuenta en los foros comunitarios, en los foros comunitarios hablando un poco de in inmigración, eh, hablaba de, de, de la ley y Washington Working Act y la gente no lo sabía. No sabía como que teníamos esta ley para empoderar a nuestra comunidad. Entonces, en todos los foros comunitarios empecé a hablar sobre el, la importancia de, de, de esta ley y cómo nos beneficiaba a nosotros los inmigrantes. Entonces, uh, una de las cosas que también nos hemos dado cuenta es eh, que tenemos mucha resistencia en, el área, en, la, en las áreas rurales este, donde nosotros servimos. Eh, tenemos un sheriff que se llama, el, no sé si lo han oído, Sheriff Songer, que tiene un show a uh, todos los martes este, eh, online, que ahora sí promueve las uh, teorías de con conspiración de la ultraderecha y deshumaniza también a las personas de color entre, entre las características del show. Este sheriff, hace un par de años, estuvo un, unas reuniones eh, públicas donde estuvimos presentes con, con otros sheriff de, del área. Y una de las cosas este, sobre eh, una reunión pública sobre a, a poder abordar las políticas de modelo que ACLU estaba aconsejando y acordaron que no adoptaría ninguna de las nuevas políticas de modelo de, de la Unión de Estudiantes Estadounidense de las Libertades Civiles en corto plazo. Estas, este, con, estos consejos eran un poco para a frenar la masa de deportación que había creado Trump en, cuando apenas sumió. Cuando estuvimos en la reunión, este, nos dejaron muy claro que, eh, que todas las agencias que estaban representadas ahí co seguirían cooperando con AI si una persona era detenida por la ciudad o el condado, tenía antecedentes penales, penales o había violado la ley local o estatal. Voy a leer una de las cosas que... Uh, dijo a uh, Songer en esa reunión, dice que no estoy de acuerdo con la mayoría de ACLU en la posición sobre este tema. Creo que están tratando de obligar a la fuerza del orden público a seguir sus ideales de cómo operar la aplicación de la ley. 
la conclusión es que no tenemos los agentes para salir aquí y hacer redadas en todas partes. No tenemos el poder humano para hacer eso, continuó Songer. Pero aquellos que están aquí, sin papeles, y cometen delitos adicionales o actividades delictivas, además del hecho de que están aquí sin papeles, dijo otra palabra, pero no la voy a mencionar, cuando los arrestemos, ahí será notificado y honraremos la decisión de ahí sobre si lo detienen. Es una de las cosas como... Eh, en, hemos visto que el departamento del sheriff generalmente hace tráfico de, con, de control de tráfico y generalmente para a, nuestra, a nuestras comunidades por una, por una luz este, que no funciona este, de su auto o por un stock que supuestamente la persona no lo hizo y generalmente paran a, a la comunidad latina cuando salen de su trabajo la mayoría trabajan en, en las empaquetadoras o en el campo, en, en las granjas que son muy grandes, y generalmente hacen ese tipo de profiling con, con nuestra gente. Uh, por eso creo que como organizador, mi enfoque es, fue acercarme con Alice, que está aquí presente, y tra transmitirles mis miedos sobre cómo estaba siendo implementado o no Key Washington Working Act, en diferentes partes de, de, la, de Washington, especialmente en las áreas rurales, donde sabemos que la, la, los movimientos de ultraderecha y, y los ataques a los inmigrantes y la deshumanización a los inmigrantes eh, es real. Nosotros lo vivimos, lo vivimos en las escuelas con... Este, uh, lo, lo, lo vimos en las la políticas de los, de los distritos escolares y en los, y en los series console. Entonces, uh, nuestra obligación como organizador es llevar esa información que justamente no, no le llega a las áreas rurales por falta de recursos, por falta de información eh, y, y crear este tipo de, de oportunidades. Eh, una de las cosas que estoy agradecido es tener esta oportunidad de poder hablar y, y decirles a ustedes cómo nuestra comunidad en, en el Gorge vive con el tema de inmigración, con el tema de un sheriff que, que es, um, él dice que es constitucionalista. Y ustedes saben lo que significa ser un sheriff constitucionalista, que ellos creen que están por encima de las leyes estatales, por encima de las leyes este, uh, federales y que son la última palabra de la ley. Y creo que en ese sentido es, un, es una alerta es para poder seguir este, informándonos y ver qué está pasando con la implementación de Key Washington Working Act. Eh, des, desde mi parte, como organizador, como les dije, es, mm, es seguir promoviendo esta ley, dando los recursos a nuestra comunidad, entrenándola, este, dando seminarios eh, sobre conoce tus derechos, que son muy importantes para nuestra comunidad, y no esperar hasta que haya una crisis para poder enseñarlo o que haya un gobierno como el, el anterior para poder este, uh, eh, empezar este tipo de seminario como conoce tus derechos. Eh, soy uno de los promotores que se tiene que hacer este ahorita y poder este, uh, promover la justicia social. Entonces solamente quiero agradecer por esta oportunidad, agradecer que eh, traigan la Universidad de, de Washington, pueda traer a, a, las, a los miembros de las áreas rurales que yo represento a esta mesa de escucha y que ustedes pueden escuchar cómo, cómo afecta, como dijo eh, Clark County, que tam, donde también nosotros servimos, eh, a, afecta también, digamos, el, Vieron el, el, el documento cómo ICE estaba trabajando con, con la policía, con la, con la cárcel local. Entonces es un ejemplo que tenemos que estar alerta y, y pedir a los, nuestras autoridades que cumplan que la ley. Eso es todo. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias, well, Juan. 
I want to also thank you for sharing these insights with us, not only tonight, but in general, um, as the research that we do is intended to support efforts like yours. Um, so to the extent that you discover new patterns or new things that it would be useful for our team to look at, uh, we are looking forward to continuing our collaboration in the future. And now I want to uh, introduce Elise Bojani, who works with One America um, and has been working closely with Huang for some time. Elisa is policy counsel at One America. She was born in Karachi, Pakistan, and she moved to Washington State when she was 10 years old. She eventually came to the University of Washington where she obtained her BA and then her JD and LLM, uh, her LLM in Sustainable International Development. And today, she manages One America's state and federal immigration policy, which includes working with directly impacted people in communities across our state to determine what should be the organization's legislative priorities and advocating for a future where everyone can thrive, regardless of immigration status. Thank you for being with us, Elise. Thank you, uh, Angelina, and I hope everyone can hear me. Um, so once again, my name is Elise Bojani. I use she, her pronouns. I'm policy counsel with One America. Um, and thank you so much to the UW Center for Human Rights for inviting me here. And I never thought I would say this, but I really missed the reactions button because I was so impressed and so energized by all of my panelists, the co-panelists and the excellent, excellent work that they are all doing. So. Um, I hope y'all are just as energized as I am um, as I dive into this section. Um, so One America does immigration and refugee advocacy um, in Washington state on three levels, local, state, and federal. Um, and our three main issue areas are immigration, education, and democracy. One America started as an organization called Hate Free Zone under Congresswoman, now Congresswoman Jayapal after 9-11. Um, and we are closing in on our 20th year anniversary this year. So talking about Keep Washington Working, Annie talked a lot about the start of the bill. And one of the things I want to emphasize is that this bill took was some years in the making. This was not a process that had happened in one legislative session or in a matter of a few months. This was a work over, the, over several years. Um, and it took the effort of both grass tops and grassroots organizing to have the win in 2018. As Annie said, we were one of the first states to do this, and it took a huge coalition uh, to get it through to the finish line. And each coalition member had a different role. So we needed grassroots organizing for base building, um, you know, have people show up to rallies, have people calling their members, um, their legislators, and demanding that this law be passed. Then we had organizations like Annie's and like the Northwest Immigrant, right, Immigrant Rights Project that were the more legal organizations that ensured that the language in the bill was legal, that would pass muster, and that it would be, um, you know, we could get it through the courts. And that is highly important as well. And then finally, we needed advocacy organizations to do lobbying, to make sure that legislators understood why this bill was important, and then working with legislators to ensure that they voted yes on the bill. So that was one America's main role with the bill. Um, we worked primarily with the ACLU of Washington and Columbia Legal Services to do bill lobbying, as well as some bill analysis. Um, what does lobbying entail? It's a lot of meetings. Um, this was prior to the Zoom era, so that meant going in person, talking to legislators, and it's necessary to have that lobbying 
be in conjunction with grassroots effort because the legislator isn't going to care what One America is saying if they're not also hearing it about the importance of this bill from people in their district. So it was truly a joint concerted effort. Another thing that One America did was use support for Keep Washington Working as a key part of our endorsement process. So when we were working with legislators and saying, if you want One America to say, we support you in your election campaign, you have to say that you support the Keep Washington Working Act and you have to vote yes on it. And we are watching and we will keep you accountable. And so that is another way that some organizations can leverage their power to gain and keep support and keep our legislators accountable to their constituents um, and their values. The other two key pieces are the ripple effects of local wins. So Keep Washington Working was able to happen because there was city level work around this as well. So both the city of Seattle and King County had sanctuary policies and those helped model the Keep Washington Working Act for the state. Um, they could see that this was a testing ground, that it improved safety and security for residents, that, and that could translate to the state level. And then the other part was the Trump administration. As Annie said, it created, the Trump administration ramped up the enforcement machine, and that federal hostility really emphasized the need for urgent state level action. Um, and we were able to leverage that as well. And then finally, one of the reasons that the work that the UW Center for Human Rights does is so important is that the bill itself does not have um, an enforcement mechanism in it. So there's no way necessarily if a sheriff is um, violating the law to really hold them accountable, except for bringing to the public eye their violations. And that is both important work from the UW Center for Human Rights and important work that Juan was mentioning of actually folks being in the community and alerting us that this is happening and making sure that that continues to come to light. So I wanted to pivot to talk a little bit about the federal about federal immigration. So the reason we need laws like Keep Washington Working is because the federal government is hostile to immigration. Um, we have not had significant positive changes in the immigration system since 1986. That is unacceptable, but continues to be our reality. Last year, we worked with our grassroots leaders to fight for a pathway to citizenship using budget measures to kind to deal with some of the realities of the Senate voting realities. Um, unfortunately, that failed. Not, and yeah, that failed. And there's no other way to say that. Um, and so this year we are focusing and pivoting on uh, to President Biden and seeing the power that the president can use to have executive actions, to have temporary relief for people through things like temporary protected status for certain countries, as well as through um, doing things like lifting Title 42, which prevents people from applying for asylum, which is their human right um, at the borders when they approach the borders. So those are some of our main policy priorities for this year. And our other focus is working with the senators, um, particularly Senator Patty Murray, on reducing funding for ICE and CBP. This is key because ICE and CBP have gotten funding increases every year since they were created in their current format after 9-11. And they have used that money to imprison more people and as Thara and uh, Thomas talked about, to increase their surveillance 
exponentially and over everyone, regardless of immigration status. So these are huge abuses that must be curtailed and that they deserve, they need accountability. And that is what we will be pushing for this year as we continue long-term fights for status and pathways to citizenship for everyone here. Um, so I think that's it. I'll hand, oh, um, so finally, if you're interested in joining us, um, if particularly if you're an immigrant, if you're a directly impacted person, um, join us at our monthly meetings. Um, you'll get to learn about us, how we organize. I believe that the Center for Human Rights folks are gonna put the link in the chat. Otherwise, feel free to email me at well, as well as Elise at weareoneamerica.org. Um, our May monthly meeting um, will be particularly great because we will be talking about more about our immigration platform. So once again, thank you everyone for being here um, and a special shout out to the interpreters for their excellent work. Well, I want to th thank all of our panelists. Um, I, I, and one of the things I most enjoy about this kind of work is the multi-scalar approach, right? So you can see how people are contributing from all different levels, not only different types of organizations, but focused on different priorities, but can come together here in the state of Washington, both to pass uh, groundbreaking legislation and also then to make sure that that legislation is actually complied with. So we have a few remaining minutes um, to do some questions and answers. So just a reminder to all those who are joining us, if you have any questions um, for our panelists, uh, please type those into the question and answer field. Um, and I'll kick us off with some questions here. We have a question actually for our student researchers, uh, Tara and Thomas. When you got into this research or in the process of doing this research, what was most surprising for you? That's a great question. Um, I can I can start. Um, I think for me, what I found most surprising is um, the way that the public records law can be so powerful, I think. Um, but at the same time that we are met with such a limitation, um, I think within it, because um, I think we actually are able to unearth um, um, just an amazing amount of detail from the records that we get, but at the same time, we're at, you know, we're waiting at the beck and call of public records officers who are both overburdened um, and maybe sometimes even unwilling um, sometimes to give us information. Um, we've had this happen with a few different counties where we request too many installments of emails um, and they start to kind of slow roll us. Um, and so, it can be difficult to get access to newer and more updated information um, just through public records. And so I found it really surprising and interesting um, to see the different ways that we've come up with to kind of circumvent that limitation of public records. Um, and I, yeah, I really enjoyed seeing it kind of evolve over the years. Something that often surprises me in the work is when each of us on, on the team and in the coalition seems to be focused on, on what might look like a very minute detail of Keep Washington Working implementation. But as we talk through it with each other, we start to understand how it fits into a bigger picture. And it, it never uh, ceases to fascinate me when all of these small, maybe meaningless details come together and really help us understand how the law is affecting people in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, that's an exciting part of the work. Thank you. We have another question here, uh, Annie, at the beginning. Uh, uh, Annie mentioned uh, that this work uh, was in part uh, inspired by the WDA's efforts to ensure and support public defenders um, in their uh, practical efforts to defend their clients. And I know in One America, you all came to this network also seeking um, information that could help you advance your uh, work with communities, grassroots communities in our state. I wonder if you um, could share with us some of the sort of follow-up that you've been able to do thanks to the information that was uncovered through this process. Maybe Elise? Yeah. 
Um, so I, some of the things we were able to do, um, I think is our, a, a lot of our bases are in Clark County and in Yakima. So when we have our meetings, that's where we tend to focus on as a coalition. So when we do our monthly meetings, um, the students pass us those emails and then we can have rallies, do meetings with the sheriff's office, work with folks like Juan to ensure that um, there are know your rights trainings happening on a local level because you know things happen in Olympia, but that doesn't necessarily mean that folks on the ground know what's happening. And we also have to acknowledge the huge power differential and how comfortable someone is going to feel actually talking to an ICE officer or is saying, you know, like you don't have the right to have this information. Um, so those are some of the ways that um, the UW Center for Human Rights Works um, helps us uh, engage on the local level. Thank you, Elise. Uh, we also have a question here. Um, the question is, could you speak to the UW Center's engagement with Tacoma's ICE Detention Center? Why does the state continue to host this odious institution? Um, maybe I'll just say a few words about that in, uh, in my role as center director. And if anyone wants to chime in on that as well, you're welcome. Um, in terms of the our center's involvement with the ongoing struggles against abuses committed at the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma, um, we have published a series of research reports, often drawing on similar um, methods in terms of public records requests um, and that same type of research, but applying it to the challenges of, uh, of trying to document what's happening inside the facility and the human rights concerns that raises. I believe we've published uh, four reports and our fifth actually is going to be published just next week. So uh, we anticipate releasing it on Monday or Tuesday. That report is about uh, reports of sexual abuse and assault at the facility and uh, ways in which those have apparently been mishandled uh, based on the documentation we were able to receive. So we work uh, as a, uh, as I said before, sort of the technical folks producing some of this research and um, the folks on the front lines of that struggle include some of our panelists right here. So I, I don't know if anybody wants to, to speak to perhaps this broader question of why the state continues to host such an odious institution. I can try and chime in a little bit on that. So. Uh, the coalition around shutting down the Northwest Detention Center is led by grassroots orgs like uh, La Resistencia, um, and they One America contributes a small part uh, to really their advocacy on this. So um, we won an enormous victory in, I want to say, the 2020 legislative session. Um, resulting in the shutting down of all private prisons in Washington state. Um, and the Northwest Detention Center is the only one um, in Washington state. Unfortunately, they did have a contract with ICE um, that means that ends in 2025. So 2025 is the slated closing date for that institution. Um, and a lot of what the state says, you know, they have limited power over this because it is a federal facility. So we do do um, advocacy with our members of Congress on this issue in particular. And one of the main things happening right now that you should call your member of Congress about is that um, they have not allowed visitors since the start of COVID. Um, and that's been over two years now and every other, most other prisons in the state do allow visitors. So the COVID justifications for it are entirely fabricated and um, inhuman. Thank you, Elise. Would anyone else like to speak to this issue? Any of our other panelists? Okay, um, I will then turn to our next question here, um, which I think in light of time uh, may need to be our uh, last question. It's, um, and I guess maybe I'll broaden this to the whole panel. Uh, 
what's next then for um, for immigrant rights advocacy in Washington State? You've mentioned some great gains that have been made in legislative gains that have been made in uh, recent years, and you've mentioned some things that at the federal level are objects of concern that we should rally around. Here at the local level, um, what's coming? What's next? I could start. <laughs> Um, what a fantastic question. Um, one of the things that we will be talking about in our May monthly meeting, meeting is exactly that, is that the wins on the local level help build power to have long-term gains on the federal level as well. So for One America, some of our state priorities for the upcoming year, um, number one will be creating um, an unemployment system for undocumented workers. Um, right now, undocumented workers are folks who are working in some of the industries that had the highest rates of layoffs when COVID started and had no social safety nets um, when, you know, their jobs laid them off. Um, and so that was one of the biggest concerns and needs that arose out of community in 2020 and is one of our long-term goals to have a bill um, our bill failed the last two years, but we're gonna continue working um, over the next few, few months to improve that bill. Um, in fact, I just heard today that Colorado passed this week um, unemployment insurance for undocumented workers. Um, so that proves that this is possible and that it is necessary. So we wanna continue building urgency around that. Um, some of the other priorities are around um, voting rights, um, ensuring that there is no discrimination um, when folks are voting and have the ability and access to vote. Um, and then, um, so that would be in some improvements to the Washington Voting Rights Act. Um, and then finally, some others around eligibility to run for school board elections. Right now, if you are a lawful permit resident, you are excluded from running for school board elections. And this came to light when a community member was elected um, to school board and was there to be invested or you know whatever, to become, take on her role. And then they were like, oh, you're not a citizen. You can't be a school board um, member. Um, so those are some of our upcoming projects. Thank you for that question. Thank you. I had no idea about the school boards. That's really interesting and egregious. Well, Juan, I know that you told us about the efforts that uh, that you're already engaged in and that are needed in your community, but are there ways others elsewhere in Washington can support uh, the work that you're doing in, in your community? Um, yes, uh, sí, por, uh, por favor, este, uh, sería interesante tener más conversaciones de con Know Your Right, Conoce Tus Derechos, este, en, entrenamientos eh, lamentablemente tuvimos que suspender uno por el la pan por los el brote de Omicron pero eh, lo importante es seguir informando a la, a la comunidad eh, que tiene sus derechos que hay una ley que los apoya que es importante que, que, que sepan y y tal vez digamos hacer un programas de Facebook, este, que poder extender nuestra voz para que la gente sepa. Lamentablemente, mucha de nuestra comunidad todavía no sabe eh, sobre esta ley, no solamente en las áreas rurales, sino también en, eh, en diferentes eh, áreas suburbanas. Entonces, creo que en ese sentido es muy importante seguir trabajando para, uh, para pasar la voz, como decimos en, en español, pero... Uh, y seguir trabajando para aumentar los derechos de los inmigrantes aquí en, en Washington. Hay mucho más trabajo para hacer. Este, soy uno de los primeros que voy a apoyar el desempleo para los trabajadores indocumentados. Este, porque donde, donde yo trabajo, donde yo sirvo, la, el 95% de las personas son indocumentadas y creo que hace falta un, digamos, y fueron infectadas por el COVID. Entonces es una, sería una muy buena idea para, este, para poder enfatizar in the future. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I really appreciate that and look forward to continuing to work with you as also with you, Alice. And I wanna thank all of, uh, all of our guests today, everybody who has joined us. Um, it's been a really great discussion, but I want to uh, 
th extra thank all of our panelists, including our student panelists, um, and everybody for being here and continuing to support not only the work of the Center for Human Rights, but our partners in this important coalition. Um, you will hear from us. We're continuing to do this work, and uh, we would love to bring more folks on board and more areas of work on board as well. So uh, thanks for being with us tonight, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Good night, everyone. <laughs>